Excellent. Well, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, depending where you are. Welcome to this online seminar of the Central Asia Program at the George Washington University. My name is Marlene Lawell. I'm the director of the Institute for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies, uh, who is, which is hosting our Central Asia Program. And it's my great pleasure today to receive our dear colleague, Timur Dadabayev, for a great talk on uh, his book from 2021, Narrating the Colonial Framing of Central Asian International uh, 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 Relation. Timo is a, a professor of international relations and the director of the special program for Japanese and Eurasian studies at the Faculty of Social Sciences and Humanities at the University of Tsukuba in Japan. He has been publishing several books on uh, Japan and China's uh, role and entry in roads in Central Asia, has been working also a lot on memory and oral memory in Central Asia. And his latest book from 2021 was discussing these issues of understanding the coloniality of knowledge for the Central Asian region and the way we are framing the role and the place of Central Asia on the international scene and how this coloniality aspect is kind of playing a role on the frame we are projecting uh, uh, on Central Asia. And as we were discussing with Timur, the book was done and written largely before the war, but it has kind of got a kind of second life given the current context and the, the current discussion on decolonizing uh, the field, both from a Russian perspective, but also from Western perspective. So I think Timur will be able, having both this kind of Uzbek Japanese uh, 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 vision of the field can uh, 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 give us a kind of a really fascinating perspective. So Timur, thank you so much for joining us, especially knowing how early it is in Japan right now. I give you the floor for about half an hour and then we will have the second half of the hour for the, the Q&A. Okay, um, thank you very much, Marlene, for uh, your kind invitation and for uh, facilitating this talk. I'm um, actually privileged uh, to speak in front of this audience, and uh, you know, I would like to thank you uh, for everyone, you know, for taking time to uh, be part of this discussion. Now, let me, uh, you know, share my uh, slides with you so that you know um, uh, you will have a better understanding of what I'm going to talk about um, in front of you. Now, uh, you know, my um, as Marlene has uh, um, kindly suggested, uh, this book has been written in. Um, um, Autumn of uh, two thousand, well, published in autumn of two thousand twenty-one, and um, um, it uh, uh, has been uh, sort of uh, in writing before the you know the ongoing war in Ukraine, and also you know it was not so well now you know, as we were discussing with Marlene you know this notion of the decolonizing is uh, you know uh, widespread. Uh, in respect to uh, post-Soviet space in general, but also internationally. However, my own sort of um, understanding and uh, you know the motivation has been informed largely by uh, you know my uh, um, the, the program that we run here. You know we run the largest uh, you know the English language program, educational program in Japan, and uh, you know we uh, actually observed you know the uh, way uh, different theoretical assumptions have been used by our students. Uh, and that actually was the motivation to uh, reflect on it in a, in a wider sort of uh, um, uh, um, sort of space. You know, so uh, in terms of the uh, uh, problem that I am dealing, and I often get this question about, you know, what is the actual problem that you know we're uh, trying to problematize? And um, um, these are fourfold. The first problem that we see is that you know very often. Uh, the international behavior of Central Asian states, um, um, as depicted in different images, are uh, narrated through the Western. You know, and when when I say Western, these are mostly Anglo-Saxon, uh, you know, theoretical assumptions or the assumptions which are popular and uh, you know narrated in sort of Russia. And uh, with the Anglo-Saxon tradition of uh, narrating, it's quite obvious because you know the majority of theories of international relations they are produced in the West. And so uh, it's quite natural, but we also do have Russian frames. The major problem with this kind of uh, narration is that you know there is uh, very few, uh, you know, uh, Central Asian inputs into these narratives, and you know uh, many, uh, you know, behavior. Well, you know, majority of uh, you know state behavior uh, patterns uh, in Central Asia are you know associated or related uh, to the Anglo-Saxon uh, you know narratives or to the Russian narratives. This also has the implication or, you know, the kind of uh, reflection on how, uh, you know, students 
learn about Central Asia, you know, uh, and in a very simple sort of exercise would be to look into the bibliographies of majority of papers written on the region, and you would uh, actually clearly see the uh, hierarchy of knowledge, which is dominated by the Western Russian scholarship, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, at the expense of the Central Asian scholarship, which is not perhaps as powerful as the Anglo-Saxon and Russian, but, but it's, it exists. The third sort of um, um, aspect of the problem is that, you know, there are very few venues for knowledge generation or very few formats uh, of knowledge generation in uh, on Central Asia, in Central Asia and for Central Asians. And, well, you know, I get this, uh, well, many people sort of um, um, reject this notion by saying, well, there are multiple international conferences uh, taking place in Central Asia, most recently in Uzbekistan, but also in Kazakhstan. So, you know, uh, uh, they are there. However, you know, a majority of these um, international sort of formats, they turn into the, the showcases of exchanges of Western and Russian scholars with the Central Asian governments. And, uh, you know, uh, the, to some extent, this uh, represents the mixture of the Soviet grant event tradition when, you know, it was important to have large events, you know, and, uh, you know present the country to the international community. But, but it is also the, the, the mixture of the Western marketization strategy that these countries are learning. So it's a, it's a kind of hybrid, post-colonial hybrid uh, of the Soviet grant tra event tradition and Western marketization uh, strategies. Uh, in this kind of setting, uh, the purpose of these events for the uh, most part are not uh, um, uh, knowledge generation, but rather the foreign and domestic recognition. And as such, you know, this is a different purpose, uh, you know, that these events serve. In the majority of cases, you know, these are not places for epistemic communities of scholars to exchange their views. And very often when, you know, participants are selected for these events, you know, the name, name value of the institution or the name value or the brand of the country um, uh, plays the most important um, um, uh, element. And when you uh, just, you know, for your own sort of sake, when you look at the, uh, you know, program of um, um, uh, attendees, you know, you, you would notice that, you know, sometimes these events are full of the people who never publish on Central Asia or who never publish at all, you know, they, but they are placed in the proper institutions. And so they are, they could serve the purpose of justifying you know, the certain policies, and that's why they are part of these discussions. And uh, you know, the final point about this is that, you know, major academic platforms, uh, which um, um, serve the purpose of discussing these issues, uh, like, you know, Central Eurasian Studies Society or European uh, Society for Central Asian Studies, are located outside of the region. And there is no uh, regional platform uh, uh, for uh, discussing these ideas. Uh, there are no, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, sort of regionally based um, book prizes, you know, uh, and, you know, these are all based outside of the region. And this, again, creates this hierarchy of knowledge when Central Asian scholars need to go outside of the region in order for their ideas to be recognized and accepted uh, as proper ones. Now, this actually creates this logic that anything local is uh, more, uh, any, anything local is less progressive than uh, anything foreign. And this is not new for Central Asian region. Uh, this actually reminds us, you know, of early Soviet years of 1920s, when anything which was Russian was considered to be more progressive than anything, anything Central Asian. Or, you know, late Soviet year, years, when anything foreign, it doesn't, it didn't really matter what, you know, the foreign was, you know, was considered to be much better than anything Soviet and definitely much better than anything Central Asian. So you already see that, you know, this logic of, uh, you know, foreign versus local is building up and this hierarchy of foreign being better um, is uh, uh, being constructed. Now, many people say, well, yes, this is true. This is true not only for Central Asia, but, you know, for, you know, majority of countries in Latin America, in Africa and other countries. So what is the practical implication of that? You know, isn't it just philosophical sort of um, uh, discussion that, you know, that uh, drives this, you know, the, the, uh, this particular logic? Well, it's, it's not, you know, in terms of practical implications, I see, you know, two, um, you know, sides to it. One is global and another is local. In terms of, you know, global implication, we actually see that, you know, uh, regions like Central Asia, they remain uh, very marginal in constructing, uh, you know, international relations theories. 
And um, actually, this is counterproductive not only for the purposes of representation of Central Asia or smaller regions in international relations, but it is also counterproductive to the very purpose of theoretical reasoning uh, or the theories of international relations. So that's that's a you know big set of implication that we need to to overcome. The images of uh, you know IR in the region are either generalized upon based on the universal um, um, experiences which are based on the Western or you know Russian uh, you know uh, notions, or alternatively inquired uh, into the uh, you know the peculiarities of a particular region, which are represented by the emerging post-positivist studies. However, you know, um, uh, this creates this gap between these two groups of studies, one talking about the universal applicability of certain ideas, another talking about very particular central Asian sort of meaning of certain notions. However, there is no dialogue between these two. And I think, you know, this is a big problem because I, I'm afraid that, you know, the theory of international relations is going to be to end up as a dead body of knowledge if we do not have this, you know, dialogue with the more diverse world than uh, you know, um, uh, the one which is exemplified by the West and Russia. The uh, another set of uh, practical implication comes from the regional perspective. And that is, you know, uh, Central Asian states um, have no clearly defined identities in international relations, unfortunately. And very often they are associated with the Russian world, Islamic world, Middle Eastern world, or Asian world. And, um, and sometimes even Slavic world. And these are not ground, you know, they, 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 you know, this kind of reasoning does have certain ground, but, you know, there's no uh, particular sort of identity associated with Central Asian states. And um, in that particular stance, the policy uh, in respect to these uh, countries is being shaped according to this, you know, confusion about their uh, you know, identity. And um, uh, in that sense, you know, Central Asian governments have never been very comfortable with the way their interests are generalized upon from the uh, international experience and the way the Western world and Russia often uh, sort of impose their own agenda on Central Asian states. Now, you know, about this imposition, people would say, well, you know, there is no imposition. You know, this is on the uh, Central Asian governments on their own accept this, you know, choices, but this is not exactly true. In this book, uh, you know, we argue, I argue that, you know, over the 30 years of the history of the states, uh, you know, they were always uh, presented with the binary choices. Uh, you know, if you look into the path of development, they were always, uh, you know, given the choice of the, you know, free enterprise or free uh, market economy versus Chinese path or, you know, the third path as, as the only viable alternative. In terms of democracy, they were always given this binary choice of whether being part of the Western democracy or being part of a dictatorship. There was no middle way. In terms of the foreign policy, they were always, and you know, they continue to be um, uh, framed as uh, you know, bandwagoning Russia and China, or uh, uh, as they strive or striving to become the part of the West and free world. You know, to be frank, you know, I think we these both images uh, are not uh, properly reflecting what Central Asians want. And in, term, in the times of crises, you know, uh, take Iraq, Afghanistan, Ukraine, for that matter, you know, there is always this dichotomy of, you know, being pro-West and being, uh, you know, pro-Russia in China, leaving no uh, place for Central Asian input about, you know, what really Central Asia wants. And, uh, you know, these binary alternatives, uh, you know, quite often require picking extreme choices. And, uh, you know, these are not necessarily... Uh, the you know justified by central Asian realities because central Asians do not tend to pick the extreme choices, and um, in uh, that particular sense, you know, uh, you know this kind of binary presenting binary choices actually victimizes central Asian states and uh, you know um, makes their position uh, posi positions on different issues restrained, unvoiced, private. Uh, leaving this, you know, big question out, uh, you know, um, uh, about what are the features of Central Asian regional international relations? And what is it that these states actually want? So, um, now in the same way, uh, you know, th there is this uh, implication uh, which is inquiry related, because uh, although we do, uh, you know, talk quite often about the focus on the region and importance of the region, we uh, operate with the uh, colonial imaginaries quite often. And these are very popular. For instance, take this, you know, uh, the 
my kindest heartland or you know uh, spy bands uh, rimland dichotomy ingrained in central asian mind uh by russians or by by british and uh, you know I, I would it would be even more surprising to find out that you know for instance the you know my kindest heartland uh you know uh, theoretical assumption is not so popular in the west now but it is extremely popular uh, in russia and in in central asia in the same way, this you know, notion of the well, never dying notion of the great game narrative or new great, great game is, uh, you know, it remains popular. In sort of more recent, uh, you know, uh, events or, you know, narratives, we see, uh, you know, the belt and road um, um, as the, you know, new sort of um, um, imposition or imaginary. And in that uh, imaginary, again, Central Asia is attributed the, the, the uh, function of the road, you know, or second belt, you know. Uh, or the uh, you know um, land bridge, you know, and um, uh, this is very puzzling to, to say the least. Also, you know, for instance, I've been recent uh, recently in one of the conferences, one of the you know very famous uh, scholar of Central Asia, you know, she would say, well, you know, we want to have a bottom up approach, you know, and to be frank, you know, I do understand this is a figurative speech, so you know, people do refer to the bottom up, you know, when they want to refer to the local. However, you know, if you look into the American studies, so European studies, you know, you would really find anyone referring to Europe or U.S. as a bottom. So how, you know, um, uh, justified it is to refer to the region you study as a bottom uh, is something very puzzling. In the same way, you know, when we operate with the notions of cooperation or national sovereignty, you know, we distort these notions. For instance, in the case of cooperation, essentially, it when applied to Central Asia, it means charity. It means giving. Although cooperation, by its definition, is a different term, it, it implies two-way uh, process. In the same way, you know, the national sovereignty uh, is counterposed to this regionalism, and this is not the case in Central Asia. So this book is about deconstructing these notions and uh, showing the tensions in the uh, in terms that we use, and then uh, deconstructing them and showing this, you know, terms from a regional perspective. In a uh, um, majority of these powerful narratives, both in academia and in media, you know, these are, uh, uh, they present Central Asia as a, you know, as a purpose of function, and not in, in, in an agency which has its own sort of voice. And in many cases, these agencies, when attributed to them, they, they're given this, you know, these images of clients of Russia and China, as being Switzerland of uh, you know Central Asia or being Kuwait and North Korea of Central Asia again referring these states to other examples and uh, sort of classifying them within this you know global paradigms. So uh, the problem that you know uh, I try to uh, emphasize in this uh, uh, book was that you know uh, we see these images we see this you know uh, tensions but we tend to ignore them. So essentially, you know, the main question addressed in this book, um, um, or the main questions addressed in this book, are twofold. What are the major contemporary theoretical approaches and their limitations uh, in narrating Central Asian region in international relations? And uh, what are the possible ways for the dialogue of this, you know, conflicting views uh, coming from uh, global IR and, uh, you know, the uh, local sort of perspectives on it? Now, uh, for those of us who are coming from, uh, you know, international relations background, it is a, you know, well-known fact that, you know, international relations as a field uh, is um, heavily dominated by rationalist schools. And among them, you know, these are realist traits and liberalist traits. Uh, and as you well know, you know, the realist traits, they emphasize the power of the government and the state, that the world is, you know, the uh, world of, uh, you know, selfish uh, uh, state behavior, that sovereignty is sacred based on Westphalia system, um, uh, the world is anarchy and, uh, you know, competition, etc. On the other hand, the uh, liberalist, uh, you know, notions, they emphasize that, you know, there is a shared interest based on the liberal values of democracy, which are universally applicable. However, you know, we also arrived at the point that, you know, these two uh, dichotomous uh, images of international relations are considered to be now the tyranny of false polarities, meaning that, you know, we actually have more alternatives to, uh, you know, narration than just these two positions. Now, in terms of alternatives, we do have Marxist, you know, very powerful Marxist rhetoric. We do have English school. We have, you know, post-colonial studies. We have, you know, um, um, 
what is it, uh, uh, post-structuralist, post-modernist analysis, we do have very powerful constructivist analysis. So we do have alternatives to this, you know, rational uh, choices. However, you know, when applied to Central Asia, we see that, you know, that rationalist schools still dominate in you know, narrations in, in Central Asian studies. And, uh, you know, we, in recent years, we also see that, you know, there are a great, uh, you know, uh, 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 very powerful, very strong uh, studies at the sort of body of knowledge which is growing up in the region and beyond it, uh, which emphasize that, you know, that notions of sovereignty, for instance, or the relationship of Central Asia to IR, or, you know, the, um, uh, the um, you know, um, uh, uh, position in Central Asia in the middle ground between this, you know, um, uh, binary sort of images of uh, realism and realism, they are building up. And so we see a great number of uh, studies and my own sort of um, uh, this book is an attempt to emphasize that we actually have this tendency towards these studies to, you know, post-structuralist uh, studies and to, to emphasize uh, that, you know, although these are very important and they uh, actually shed light on the uh, you know, images or understanding of central relations, uh, these are still, um, you know, uh, or they still constitute minority of studies. And, you know, majority uh, of studies are still dominated by this, you know, the rationalist traits of, of studies. Now, in terms of decolonization, post-colonial studies, you know, many ask me, so what do you mean by decolonizing? Uh, and, you know, it, uh, and this question actually comes not only from uh, the outside of Central Asia, but also inside Central Asia. Uh, many people in Central Asia have problems with being um, um, branded or you know, named as a colonized region. And uh, being a, uh, especially those in uh, older generations, they would have problems with the Soviet experiences being uh, branded as colonized one. And those in the younger generations, they would have problems with uh, um, sort of relating Western body of knowledge to the you know notion of the uh, coloniality, and uh, uh, but you know my own sort of understanding and this book uh, starts with this notion that you know many of our of the ideas in international relations they are based on the structure in which the Western experiences are considered to be the key and the core of the development of the of the uh, of the world, and so the notions of hierarchy inside the state and anarchy outside of it, the sovereignty produced by the Treaty of Westphalia, the European Enlightenment and progress which spread across the West and beyond the West, or the notions of humanitarian intervention, universal values of democracy and market economy, or developmental aid, they all come from this Western tradition. However, you know, they, these are not necessarily very relevant to Central Asian experiences. So this book that uh, you know I uh, you know have the privilege to present to you today is uh, you know deals with uh, you know um, the subject matter of its inquiry from two perspectives. You know, on the one hand, you know uh, yeah, this book attempts to deconstruct the dominant voices or narratives of the West, Russia, and partly China. And uh, you know the second aspect of it is a decolonial part which attempts to retrieve the voices from uh, you know Central Asia and uh, provide the narratives that they see as relevant or important. So, uh, you know, some people would say, well, you know, colonialism is not so relevant to Central Asia because people do not operate with these notions. But just, you know, look into the, the most recent um, um, example that, you know, that for instance, reforms in Uzbekistan now are called third renaissance, you know. And again, I mean, this you know, gives this, you know, very powerful image that, you know, the, you know, we're striving to go where the West or whether Europe is, you know, and so again, I mean, this is a uh, you know, very misleading concept to be used, and uh, you know, I think you know, this colonial mindset is still there. Now, uh, you know, one question that I, I got quite often from uh, my discussions of this book in different forums so was about what is uh, Central Asianness, you know, what are the features of Central Asia. You know, I, I really like this, you know, this um, um, image uh, produced by Mushtum. Mushtum is a satirical journal has been, which has been published in Central Asia throughout the Soviet history. The Russians had cro crocodile and, uh, you know, Uzbeks and some of, you know, other uh, Central Asians, they uh, used to read this Mushtum. And I read this, you know, this journal, you know, when I was very small. And so in 1990s, you know, this uh, image by Ibrahimov, you know, very famous Uzbek uh, painter, has been uh, artist has been produced, and uh, it has this uh, um, you know the 
So that the narrative suggesting that you know that all of the states are the you know like uh, five fingers of the same um, you know hand uh, you know uh, fed by the same veins and by the same and consist constituting the same flesh, thus making them of the same blood. And I think you know this is a very uh, you know uh, powerful sort of image to reflect on what Central Asia is. You know, although they are different, but, you know, they are similar yeah, to, to a great extent. And so going back to this question of what Central Asian, uh, Centralationism or Central Asianness is, you know, this book uh, in particular divides these feature, features into two. One aspect deals with what Central Asia is not. And uh, because it's easier to define, uh, you know, what something is when you can define what something is not. And then, uh, you know, the second aspect of this book defines what Central Asia is. When we talk about what Central Asia is not, we need to be very clear that, you know, uh, after 30 years of, of you know, uh, post-Soviet experience, Central Asia is not post-Soviet anymore. So uh, referring to it as a post-Soviet would be an old cliche. As, um, in the same way, Central Asia is not stunned generalizable anymore. You know, it, they are too diverse. Um, Central Asia is not rivalry driven. Central Asia is not transitional anymore. You know, there is no point of transition. You know, we actually lost this point from where we transit, uh, you know, transit to, to where we transit. So Central Asia is not transitional anymore. Central Asia is not Westphalia sovereignty based, uh, you know, society. And Central Asia is not conquest, uh, great game driven uh, region. Although this, you know, image is very, still considered, you know, uh, very powerful. So, Going back to this question, what, then what is Central Asia? Uh, you know, this book claims that Central Asian IR is identity-based and deeply socially constructed. In that particular sense, you know, this book actually contrasts and um, um, challenges this, you know, rationalist, uh, you know, view, which snapshots of what Central Asia is in particular period of time, and then claims that this is how Central Asian relations, international relations uh, progress. So in that particular sense, you know, the uh, you know, Central Asian IR is not based on the strategic real realm of the gains and losses, rivalry, et cetera, but on the notions of compromise and consensus. And this is that dictated, not be and this is not so because Central Asians are some, somewhat advanced, you know. Uh, their geographic location, their history uh, actually dictates that you know, because they coexisted with different civilizations, different empires for such a long time, they learned to use this you know skills of compromise and consensus in finding out what they want and how not to uh, you know uh, go into conflict with the interests of others. The second point here is that Central Asia is neighborhood driven. Now you know in in a few minutes I'll, I'll talk about it. Uh, we actually see the emerging neighborhood first spirit, and actually this uh, has a social connotation because in Central Asian setting, neighborhood in everyday life is very important. You know, and so uh, uh, when you define what you want in your neighborhood, you always watch out for what your neighbors want. And I think you know the, the state behavior is uh, you know uh, reflects on this neighborhood first uh, you know narrative. Now, in terms of the central Asian norms, you know, I get this question quite often, do we have central Asian norms? Can we really um, generalize upon certain norms which can be shared throughout the, the region? And the notion of sabr or endurance, which is informed by the religious notion, the Islamic religious notion of sabr or endurance is very important. The notion of maslahat, which is the you know, informal uh, you know, consultation forum, uh, which is very popular in Central Asia even today, you know, before you do anything, you, you go and, you know, consult with others, with other stakeholders or sharing. You know, all of these notions are very important for Central Asian mind. And as such, they are also important for this, you know, policymakers or state behavior. So in that particular sense, you know, um, this book, uh, you know, utilizes these different cases to, on the one hand, to show, you know, how, foreign powers uh, approach uh, Central Asia, but on the other hand, how their own uh, uh, narratives and their own sort of uh, uh, norms uh, demonstrate themselves in uh, their actions in international relations. Now, um, in terms of the features, you know, there are three particular features that I would like to emphasize as very important for Central Asian international relations, which uh, I feel are uh, not paid proper attention. Uh, the first feature is this uh, notion of the neighborhood. 
in this book, but also in other studies that I produced after this book, you know, I emphasize uh, that, you know, this uh, notion of neighborhood um, it needs to be considered to be part of the nationhood. And I think, you know, this is very different from the conventional sort of, uh, you know, theory of international relations when you would consider state sovereignty and, you know, your own sort of territorial integrity as the most important pillar of your nationhood. However, in Central Asia, you know, I argue uh, there is no nationhood without properly functioning neighborhood. Now, some people, you know, in our discussions, in other forums, you know, some people say, well, you know, neighborhood, you know, you have neighborhood everywhere. You have neighborhood in, in Europe, for instance, there is this, you know, the notion of the European Union's, uh, you know, uh, neighborhood policy, for instance, you know. However, the usage of neighborhood in Europe and Central Asia is very different. Uh, the usage of, uh, you know, neighbor, the notion of neighborhood in the European Union or the, in this policy of the European Union's, you know, neighborhood policy emphasizes that those who are in the neighborhood as, are different from those who are inside the European Union. So in, as such, you know, this notion of the policy of neighborhood is there to differentiate the, uh, um, the attitude of, uh, you know, towards those who are inside the Europe, European Union and who are outside of it. In Central Asia, it's the other way around. You know, when we emphasize neighborhoods, we emphasize belonging, common belonging. And I think, you know, this is a very different sort of uh, set of, you know, um, logic that we are operating with here. Now, in the same way, you know, the identity roots, you know, are very important because we claim that, you know, that Central Asian international relations are emotional and they are based on the social norms. So in that particular sense, we operate, you know, in this book, I operate quite often with the, uh, you know, the uh, logic which is co coming from social interactions at the, you know, um, uh, Central Asian societies level. In the same way, this notion of the regional sovereignty, you know, the, as, as you well know, sovereignty refers to the, you know, the, uh, the ability and willingness to conduct independent foreign and domestic, uh, you know, policy within your own boundaries. Now, in Central Asia, we actually see that, you know, without having regional sovereignty, there is no way to be very effective in domestic, uh, you know, policy. And in recent years, we see a lot of, uh, you know, uh, provision of, uh, you know, services and uh, goods to each other um, as a part of this, you know, understanding that, you know, in order to govern effectively within your own territory, you need to share and you need to share responsibilities with, with your neighbors. The most, well, you know, I gave you this examples of COVID uh, hospitals here. However, the, the most clearest example was the, that, you know, in recent months, you know, last month, in January, uh, Central Asia actually faced the, um, you know, the, uh, the most uh, sort of acute problem of energy uh, resources, you know, in Uzbekistan, in Kyrgyzstan, in Tajikistan. And, uh, you know, in that particular time, you know, these countries actually shared, you know, their own energy resources uh, for free to each other. Again, symbolizing that, you know, uh, uh, for them, it's important that, you know, that they effectively govern each other in order to sustain their own sort of, uh, you know, nationhood. And I think that this is very important. Now, the notions of enduring, informal collective decision-making, informal summits, or the notion of political elders, you know, with Nazarbayev, et cetera, you know, they are very important. Uh, as, as an accepted practice, which actually is rooted in the you know, Central Asian societies. Now, we also see increasing subnational connections and subnational di diplomacy. Again, diplomacy is uh, traditionally considered to be the realm of the uh, you know, government. However, we see, uh, especially in Ferganavale, we see a lot of interactions between local municipalities because they do realize that in order to resolve their problems, they need uh, not only connections at the governmental level, but also at the you know, community level. Uh, uh, a particular importance uh, is now attributed also to the terminology and to language. You know, up to recent years, you know, we've seen that you know, Russian has been used as the language of interaction between these uh, you know, uh, countries, but increasingly, we see that they're using their own uh, you know, uh, Turkic languages in communicating with each other. You know, the, the most recent example, I was quite impressed when President of Uzbekistan went to Kyrgyzstan and then uh, they were going through the uh, ministers and introducing to each other the ministers and, you know, the Kyrgyz counterparts speak in Kyrgyz and Uzbek counterparts speak in Uzbek and they perfectly understand each other. So that actually sends the message that, you know, we're transitioning uh, you know, in terms of terminology, we're using different terminology that, you know, I exemplified here with the notions of fondage, of the same blood, yeah, or, you know, neighbor, or, you know, guest loving, et cetera, et cetera. And actually these notions 
uh, you know, are not only at the uh, level of everyday communication between these governmental leaders. These are, uh, you know, included into the intergovernmental statements, which is, uh, you know, indication of the certain shared norms uh, in international law now. And the final point about this forgiveness, uh, you know, many people, for instance, in Uzbekistan consider events in southern Kyrgyzstan to be a genocide against Uzbeks. However, you know, they, you know, overcome this by, uh, you know, forgiving because they know they share this region. And, you know, with this kind of uh, grudge that you have, you know, it's very difficult to cooperate. And so this notion of forgiveness is a very big thing uh, for uh, Muslim societies in general, but also applied in Central Asian context. Now, the second feature uh, that I emphasize is this Central Asian way of signaling their intentions. Very often, uh, internet, the traditional or you know, rationalist uh, international relations, they look into what, what governments actually say in order to find out what they want. However, as I've already emphasized in Central Asian settings, strategic narratives do not necessarily mean or do not necessarily need to be um, articulated. You know, sometimes, and you know, in my in this book, but also in the you know articles that I developed after this book, we emphasize that you know the Central Asian signaling can also be in the format of strategic silence, and uh, these strategic silences do not necessarily um, imply withdrawals from international relations, or you know the strategic silences, uh, you know, uh, rather they need to be considered to be a format of resistance not to be victimized um, either by the West, by Russia, or by China. So in the same way, either these silences are rooted in the constructivist you know, logic. They are you know, products of uh, social interaction. So as such, they're not shaped by the moral ju judgments as you know, um, um, dictated by the liberalist position or strategic calculations of losses and gains. You know, these are deeply socially sort of based uh, um, um, processes. And the third feature, as I've already said, you know, the, this, you know, this notion of the nationhood through neighborhood is very important. And you know, in in this book, in the in chapter two, but also in uh, you know later in uh, in the study that I've continued after that, you know, I emphasize this in you know, the notions of you know brotherhood, uh, those of endurance, and informal collective decision making as the major norms which build up um, uh, the uh, foundation for the, uh, you know, the interactions between the states. So if you permit, I will stop here and, you know, I would be very much looking forward for any comments or questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Timur. It was just wonderful to, to listen to you and to have such a well-articulated and thought uh, um, <clears throat> vision of the field and of these issues of coloniality and also the fact that you were not only deconstructing, <laughs> but bringing uh, 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 solutions on the way on what is a kind of a, a, a decolonized way of looking at what really matters. So thank you so much. I, I'm, I know I'm sure people have really appreciated it. And we have a lot of questions. Let me begin. We have about 20 minutes. A question from our colleague here uh, um, at the Institute, Melanie Sadozai, asking if you can place the um, uh, um, decolonizing issue on relate to it with the tensions between international relations seen as kind of too theoretical and area studies seen as too empirical. And how do you think the decolonizing of the Central Asian international relation field can overcome these challenges and also having this kind of disciplinary dialogue, which is also, I think, part of the, the, the kind of decolonizing uh, uh, discussion. Okay. Thank you very much, Marlene. Do you want me to go one by one? I think so. I think for the moment, okay. let's go like that. Yeah. 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 Thank you very much. I think you know this is uh, the uh, relationship between uh, you know the field of international relations as a discipline and then uh, area studies uh, as a sort of uh, area or space of studies. You know, is very important. And you know, I get this question uh, quite often, not only uh, in this kind of forums, but also from my students. You know, so how do we balance? the importance of a particular case study with the uh, you know, in, uh, disciplinary sort of approaches. The, the answer that I sort of uh, uh, come up with for myself, but also for my students is rather simple. You know, we do have uh, uh, area studies as, uh, you know, the um, uh, space where we uh, generate uh, case studies of, of particular importance. However, 
uh, you know, the field of international relations and, uh, you know, theoretical reasoning or assumptions are important for us to have dialogue across different regions. Because what happens quite often is that, you know, in central relations studies, we have a great number of papers which reflect upon very interesting cases. However, for someone who is not interested in this particular case, but they do they have interest to, you know, about this particular phenomena, it's very difficult to relate to this. And so in that sense, you know, I, I see a great value in theoretical reasoning because, you know, this is the platform which allows us to have the same criteria and uh, to establish the dialogue between uh, regions which do not have, do not necessarily have, you know, much in common. So uh, uh, back to your question, you know, I see a, a great value in empirical cases as generating new knowledge, but also a great value in the theoretical reasoning as the uh, attempt, because uh, as you well know, uh, theories are assumptions which are based on the great number of uh, cases. If we don't have great number of cases, we don't have theory. So in that sense, you know, area studies are the backbone or the, you know, the base for the theoretical assumptions. And so, uh, you know, for the dialogue, we need theories, but for the, uh, you know, peculiarities of, uh, you know, each region, we do need uh, area studies. They are not necessarily in conflict with each other, that is the point that I would like to make. Thank you. Thank you, Timur. We have another question from our colleague Saikin Botoyeva, uh, congratulating you for the book and also saying that some of the effort of decolonizing research tend to fall into the trap of romanticizing social norms and dynamic in Central Asia. And there is, for example, the same formula as you had for the five uh, uh, fingers in Kyrgyz, uh, explaining that the five fingers are not equal mm -hmm. and that you also have a lot of implicit hierarchy Mm -hmm. uh, uh, in Central Asia, uh, about who is economically developed or cultured or advanced, and so how do you think that researchers should be kind of also mindful of power relations inside uh, Central Asia when they want to use this uh, decolonial approach? This is actually this is very um, interesting. I was also just recently thinking about when was it for the first time when, for instance, Kazakhstan was Contraposed to Uzbekistan. You know, I'm just, I was just wondering, you know, because uh, as a kid, I, you know, I grew up in Uzbekistan and I don't remember that, you know, we were ever very conscious about, you know, uh, Kazakhstan as a rival. You know, it was just, you know, uh, our neighbor, you know. And so, uh, you know, many of these inequalities or this, you know, this measurement of equalities actually are also imposed, you know. And uh, in recent discussions, for instance, whenever we have this, you know, counterposition of Kazakhstan to Uzbekistan, or you know, the you know, uh, counterposition of Uzbekistan to others, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, I feel, you know, there is evil intent uh, behind this. You know, in, in the sense that, you know, by counterposing these countries, by comparing them, and by saying, well, these are not equal, they have different capabilities. We're trying to not so much to uh, emphasize their differences, but rather we're trying to divide and conquer in some kind of way. So I feel, you know, that, you know, on the one hand, as I've already stated, you know, that we cannot generalize upon these countries as stand generalizable. We cannot claim that they're all equal. Of course, they're not equal. Yeah, just as, like in, as in human society, we're not equal. But that does not mean that, you know, that our differences in human society does not mean we are rivaling each other. In the same way, uh, in Central Asian politics, you know, the fact that they are different and each of them have their own uh, strength does not necessarily imply that uh, you know they are in in conflict with each other. I think you know this notion of conflict or notion that they need to rival each other is something which is ingrained in, into their mind. And I I am afraid uh, you know that this has been done even before the collapse of the Soviet Union within the Soviet system where the you know Soviet government had this you know manipulated this mind of central Asians to, for the funds. Uh, coming from the Soviet, uh, for, from the center. And then in the post-Soviet setting, this has been picked up by the, you know, the Western powers or by China for that matter. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, th these countries are just being manipulated. But this book in particular emphasizes that without defining what, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, their regional interest is, Central Asia does not uh, have a chance to, uh, you know, stand against, uh, you know, China, Russia, or the West for that matter. I think you know, it's very important for them to consolidate their positions in terms of the region, because 
by rivaling each other, they are not going to achieve much in, in, anyway. So it, you know, they, their difference are going to be there. Uh, no one uh, you know, questions that, but that does imply they are in the structure of uh, you know, rivalry to each other. And I think that you know, this is very important. Thank you. Thank you, Timur. Uh, another question from our colleague Olivier Ferrando about uh, uh, the unity of the region as a kind of uh, a geopolitical uh, um, entity. They are still, I mean, for all the kind of great power, are still seeing the region as a kind of entity and travel. So, so uh, Putin traveled to the five countries, Blinken is uh, uh, going tomorrow uh, uh, to Astana. So do you think there is a real dynamic in regional politics that makes sense to continue to consider the five countries together? Or do you think it's mostly the reproduction of the kind of, you know, Central Asia, kind of the, the, the Russian or Soviet version of this kind of colonial framework put on the, the five countries? Or you really have a grassroots regional dynamism that is worse politically being noticed and, and, and kind of emphasized by, by uh, uh, visitors? Thank you very much for this question. I think you know this is very important uh, because uh, you know regionalism and you know regional integration has been the subject matter of inquiries for the uh, last thirty years of their independent development. So we actually see a lot of uh, you know um, efforts uh, both at the governmental level but also at the you know local community or epistemic community level to have this you know model or the scheme to um, you know um, workable scheme of integrating these countries. However, uh, to be frank. I, I see, uh, you know, this approach to Central Asian regionalism and, you know, to integration um, um, uh, from the critical perspective by suggesting, well, you know, over the last 30 years, they were not able to you know, coordinate their positions, so there is no uh, dynamics of regionalism. I, I feel that, you know, this kind of logic uh, is counterproductive in the sense that, you know, to expect that these countries are, are going to immediately build up some kind of blocks or you know, construct their relations along the line of regionalism is uh, naive to say the least. Because you know, uh, uh, from the time of their independence, they actually learn to become uh, you know, independent states. It's like a kid, a small kid who is just born and you expect this kid to be able to do everything would be uh, nonsense. And I think you know, this is uh, you know, one aspect that I really you know, feel pro uh, is problematic. And you know, this is something that I emphasize in this book that we need to approach these countries from the point of view of social uh, construction and maturation of different processes. And as we went through 30 years of their experiences, now we see that you know, with the change of political leadership, there is a better understanding of uh, you know, the need to you know, unite and you know, to have some kind of coordinated uh, you know, positions. However, you know, I would like to warn against, um, what is it? Um, 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 uh, well, against romanticizing this you know, notion of uh, regionalism and looking into regionalism as answer to all the problems. So this is not going to happen. And most likely they are going to have different kinds of problems and there would be different kinds of conflicts. However, what is encouraging currently is that in the second generation of the political leadership, we see that, you know, that there is this drive towards uh, uh, regionalization. Uh, hypothetically uh, reasoning, I would suggest that perhaps with the change of leadership, we will see these trends towards uh, you know, regionalization increasing, depending on the outcomes. If the outcomes are going to be uh, progressive, then we're going to have you know, a better outcome. Now, the, the point of regionalism is very important because if you look into, for instance, uh, cases like ASEAN, you know, these are the countries which could actually consolidate their positions against China. And this actually uh, gives them the power to negotiate better uh, for uh, their own sort of regional interests. And I think, you know, Central Asia is not an uh, exception to this rule. So uh, in order to do so, in order to consolidate your position in respect to you know, bigger po powers, but also to use your own resources more effectively, one needs to have this dynamism. And we see some encouraging steps. So whether this is going to end up again uh, in another failure is a different question. And I think you know, even the failure is going to be the certain kind of outcome that they can learn from. So in that sense, you know, I'm, I'm quite, uh, you know, uh, optimistic about the prospects for uh, regionalism in general. Thank you. Thank you, Timo. Uh, 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 one more question on um, the fact that in the book you mostly uh, uh, focus on Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. And so the question is about the three other. First, the fact that 
course, uh, um, uh, Tajikistan cannot linguistically uh, uh, kind of exchange a lot with the two others, but even globally that we have less data and less uh, uh, local, locally produced uh, uh, academic work uh, in Turkmenistan and in Tajikistan. And so how do you think that can be articulated into the discussion on, on kind of being sure that local voices and, and viewpoints are kind of heard? No, I agree. I agree uh, that you know this book actually focuses mostly on uh, Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, simply uh, for the sake of uh, well, not not so much convenience, but you know uh, for the sake of uh, you know the data which was there and it was easier to use it. You know, I also agree that we need to have more inputs from uh, 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 Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, uh, well, ideally from Turkmenistan as well. Uh, we are currently working uh, you know, on the paper on water and uh, you know uh, uh, interactions between uh, uh, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan and Tajikistan to see uh, you know how you know their interactions can be uh, analyzed uh, you know um, uh, through the lenses of decolonization and you know regional building and uh, you know I, I just uh, have to agree I mean we need to have these additional studies well this is just a book right so we need to build on it, and you know, this is just first attempt to send this message that we need to have regional capacity building, and uh, it would be just great if we could actually reflect more on how Kyrgyz, Tajik, and Turkmen experiences relate or do not relate, you know, to the ideas that you know which are mentioned in this book. Thank you. Thank you, and and of course, one of the obvious question about how do you think the the Russia's war in Ukraine is kind of accelerating the reflection coming from the region that was already there before, but got, got this kind of accelerator of thinking about, you know, or, or helping or accelerating the way people kind of take distance or try to look at themselves and look at the presence of the relationship to Russia, to Russian languages. How do you think it's accelerating both in foreign policy, but also domestically how all these debates about, you know, decolonizing, uh, um, 19th century and 20th century Russia is kind of uh, uh, arriving in the region. It's a big question, but it's of course uh, uh, the, the very timely one. Yeah, thank you. I mean, uh, indeed. And uh, you know, one one thing that you know um, I emphasize in the studies which I produced after this book was that you know that uh, for instance, in the cases like Ukraine, you know, Central Asian states again are uh, given are uh, presented this choice of the um, agenda. Which is not necessarily theirs, you know. I, I know that you know that uh, many people would claim, well, you know, the international agenda in Ukraine or defeating Russia is uh, also Central Asian agenda. But you know, when it comes to Central Asia, this is not the case. You know, uh, Central Asia is supportive of Ukraine, is support, is uh, you know, generally critical of uh, Russian stances. But they're not, um, uh, uh, they're not articulating this uh, simply because they have their own realities to deal with. And, you know, Russia is part of this, you know, larger neighborhood. China is part of neighborhood. And, you know, I've mentioned it in different forums that, you know, for countries like Moldova or Georgia, or even Azerbaijan, you know, when you face, uh, when you have a uh, European Union next to you, it's easy to be critical of Russia, you know, because, you know, they, they do have this, you know, uh, you know, hopes to become part of European Union in the future, et cetera, et cetera. For Central Asia, it, it's unlikely that Central Asia is going to be part of European Union in the future. And so they will have to deal with Russia and China, you know, whatever the outcome of the war is. The second point is that, you know, defeated Russia is not necessarily in the interest of Central Asia, because we've been there, you know, in 1990s, when the chaos was in Russia, this was a catastrophic impact on Central Asia. And so Although Central Asia is sympathetic to the international agenda, it is not necessarily completely coinciding with the, you know, with the, um, uh, uh, with it. And you know, it's uh, it deals with Russia and China as a neighbor, which you know it cannot avoid dealing with. Now, at the societal level, again, we have this big problem. Yeah, I mean, uh, quite puzzling that you know a great number of people in Central Asia are kind of supportive of uh, you know, uh, you know, Russian aggression. In Ukraine, and the way we argue uh, um, in studies which follow this book is that you know they are deep; their information sources are deeply reliant on uh, Russian information sources. 
and this actually dictates their understanding of international events. But actually, this is not Russian problem. This is problem of Central Asia, because they failed to produce a properly functioning mass media and failed to produce civil society, which would be able to generate uh, you know, neutral positions on different in international events. So what Central Asia needs to take out of this Ukrainian crisis is that it needs to develop its own capacity to uh, you know, uh, filter the uh, you know, information about you know, outside sources. And so that, that's the point I, I, I would uh, perhaps you know, stop at. Thank you. Wonderful, Timo. Uh, uh, maybe a last question for the last few minutes we have about uh, uh, Usman Boron saying he was puzzled by the argument that Central Asia should not be understood through the Westphalian framework. But isn't the very form of the nation state a product of the Westphalian moment and therefore of European history? So how post-colonial studies who have, which have criti criticized the nation state itself as a result of European colonial expansion. So if we follow this critique, how can international relation as a field thinking of decolonization that, I mean, how do we think beyond the, the, the modern nation state if we see mm -hmm. that as something that is a product of, of kind of European coloniality or mm -hmm. European way of being? Yeah, actually, this is exactly what I'm trying to problematize. I'm suggesting that the Europeans build this notion of the contemporary or you know modern state uh, based on the Westphalian Treaty, which is established in 1648 against the uh, you know the religious you know um, um, uh, Christian you know uh, traditions. Yeah, and so we still operate with this notion in Central Asia, which has nothing to do with you know with this particular system or nothing to do with the realities of European Union. It actually comes as a surprise that someone would argue this way because actually this is exactly the point that we're trying to make. We have Central Asian realities. We have the you know history of these countries coexisting outside of the boundaries of the nation states. Yeah, you know, Central Asia did not have uh, contemporary, you know, the modern nation state, you know, in the history. This is a new creation invented by Russians, which were also colonized by Germans and French, you know, so Russians themselves are, you know, double colonized constructs, and now they impose this structure on Central Asians. Now we accept these notions as, you know, as a sacred one. I think, you know, this is uh, uh, I, the, the very question uh, of using this structure of, uh, you know, nation state, uh, uh, which was inherited by Central Asians or from Europeans through the, uh, you know, uh, uh, Russian framing needs to be questioned. I think you know, it's only natural to question this, but not the other way around. So that's the approach that I'm taking in this book. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Timor. I think we are getting kind of a, a short on time now to continue the discussion, but there would be a lot of other, uh, of course, theme and, and aspect of your book to, to discuss. So thank you so much for having find the time so early for you in yeah. Japan to talk to us and and really, thank you for having re written that book before it became such an important topic, just to <laughs> telling how much you could feel that from your own experience and the one you had with your own students about uh, uh, the need for us to rethink uh, uh, all the way we are framing Central Asia in international relations, but even more globally and everything coming also from the field and how the field is getting very actively I think and very rapidly transform right so thank you so much for for all that and we hope to kind of uh, uh, continue that discussion in in other format thank you very thank much you. and i would like to thank everyone for uh, taking your time to come here and to share your ideas thank you very mm -hmm. much thank you all bye-bye bye-bye